<clears throat> the title of this presentation is already a bit a provocation for us to think about what could be a hermeneutics of practice. I tried in this um, next slides and in this next minute, I'm gonna talk to you to de describe my experience and maybe in a way that could be useful for those doing digital work to get in a conversation with a wider group of historians, not only those in the digital realm. And when I call it considerations from 360 experiment on digital public history, it's because I actually developed at C2DH a project that allowed me to visit all the research life cycle since the documentation collection and co-creation, also the analysis, and finally experiment also on publication, on scholarly forms of digital publication, which you are gonna see in the next minutes. Yes, so perhaps the, what is looming on the background of my presentation and what was looming on the background of my mind when I applied for this um, PhD grant in the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg was this question of what we do when we do digital public history. It seems very obvious, but when we go in the detail about how do we do it, it can be very interesting. And I believe our discipline is now going through a transition moment between the, the analogic and going to the digital. And maybe for us also as a sort of um, historicizing exercise to the memory of our discipline itself, it makes sense also to ask why we are doing what we do in this way. So uh, my presentation is not only describing and talking about the methods and maybe showing the details of my methods, but it's more about why it's important to describe, to criticize these methods, to document these methods for the future of our discipline. So my first uh, diagnosis of the field of digital history was that indeed we had a lot of reflection on methods, development of tools, and all um, perhaps driven also by the development of labs, all this ethos of lab and the work as building, you know, building a scholarship, building objects, developing as a form of scholarship brought a lot of focus on methodology, but the theoretical reflection was very slow, following it very slow. And in my, <clears throat> In my PhD research, which I'm discussing now with you, uh, I was trying to look closer at how the digital component actually is conditioning historical research in its full capacity, not only in the work with the sources, not only in the work of representation and storytelling, but in the whole cycle. And when I mean the whole cycle, I think about the historiographical operation of Michel de Certeau as one of the main works I refer to. And also in which proportion this digital component is creating disturbances for what we do. And these disturbances are not only negative or positive, they can be both, they are not neutral. So this is my point. And they can enable and disable heuristic tools for what we do in historiography. And also, last but not least, uh, how digital public history can benefit from this digital component to go beyond the communication aspect of it, which has been one of the main uh, tonics in the debate of digital public history that we can use the digital to communicate, to get in touch with people, but what else, what can we do differently that is beyond using the medium uh, of the digital as a communication platform. Of course, this is in the center, but I want to look at it beyond. So for my project, as already mentioned by Forsten, I was um, researching memories of Italian and Portuguese migrants in Luxembourg. Perhaps the most uh, important motivation for choosing the topic of migration was the fact that Luxembourg has more than 45 percent of its population that is non-national uh, residents, and also that um, 
the national discourse, the official um, or the master narrative, so to say, has been in the last year uh, pushing it in a direction of uh, an harmonious living together. So we have uh, quotes that say that Luxembourg has more than 170 nationalities living harmoniously together. And I wanted to challenge it doing this public digital public history project and trying to see whether other memories, not maybe central but peripheral memories uh, in Luxembourg could tell a different story. And my solution to do that was resourcing beyond the other historiographical works, but also on crowdsourcing, which for I brought up this platform memo record, which you are seeing this roadmap on the screen now, crowdsourcing from social media and oral history interviews. This was really important that I had also these oral history interviews on the way because it added me some texture and some possibility for comparison of what I was doing with the digital that was so new, what I got from the crowdsourcing that was so new and having sort of more established methodology that I could relate and compare with the analyze the crowdsourced memories. So maybe I can show you the, the screen uh, for the memo record later on, but since it could be a bit disruptive to go on the website now, I just want to talk to you about the shaping of this platform how this was shaped participatory. So the idea, as you see in the screen, uh, was to have a sort of, um, let's say participatory design, but uh, in the beginning I didn't have this name. So this was something that came up afterwards in the process of sharing authority and finding a way on how to build together this platform. My first uh, idea was to build something very similar to what the Hoy Hosen's White Center for History and New Media has uh, set up in the early 2000s, for example, for crowdsourcing initiatives like the 11th of September. That basically you have a web page and you allow users to upload their content and add their stories. So since my idea was to do this participatory, in a participatory way, I invite a few of uh, potential participants to take part in a sample meeting to give me feedbacks about the early designs of this platform. And so I did some sketches on WordPress that was uh, one of the content, content management system I knew. And I asked them to tell me what they think, should we change something? Should we go to another platform? And the feedback I had in, in this moment was really, really strong that people were not really positive about sharing their memories in a platform like that. They were not looking for uploading content in something that was so static. And one of the feedbacks that I used to share that was really meaningful to me was someone saying that uh, she didn't want to put her story in an empty box. And conversation developed and basically I understood that they wanted something that was more similar to social media. Hence my use of social media, instead of developing a whole new platform that would, some <laughs> would try to mimetize social media. So why not using what is new in instead of reinventing the wheel? So this whole uh, part of uh, understanding how to build this was uh, based on the field work, understanding which were the sources available, doing ethnographic observation and doing this community sensitization that you see on the screen that involved the organization of a oral history project that was run over one year that involved the texting of another tool that was the memo, the Pixie Story tool for oral history developed by Michael Frisch and involved these sample meetings to get uh, feedback about the platform. Once they told me they didn't want this um, uh, platform on WordPress or this old looking web page to upload their content, I went to the tinkering phase. And the tinkering phase 
uh, just to explain this word, this concept, tinkering, it comes from the media, the archaeological, media archaeology studies. And Andreas Fickers has also been, um, in, let's say, using it not only for the archaeological media studies, but also for digital history, thinking about the double dimension or the double grasp of this word tinkering that would say to think or yes, to elaborate intellectually, but also to grasp things, to think about, uh, to think around tools and situations with the hand. So in a way that we are enhancing our senses, both intellectually and with hands-on work. And in this part of my development of the part platform, there was a lot of collaboration, not only with the people who were giving feedback on the looking of the platform, but also with computer experts, computer experts, designs, and a programmer, a developer at C2DH who helped me to build this platform from scratch. The whole code is available on GitHub as well. And finally, going public, uh, there was the last phase that you see on this uh, screen. The going public was more related to sensitizing again the population, but this time trying to activate the crowdsourcing. And how was the crowdsourcing uh, organized? Basically, I asked people to share their memories online on Facebook and Instagram using a hashtag of the project that was this hashtag memo record. And for this, there was a whole outreach strategy. We, me and uh, also the communication at the university, we did a lot of uh, interviews, little movies, videos to share online and also to take part in real events to make the project known, distribution of posters and also participation on the media. So this was already a long way, but this was just the beginning of the project. And just to build, this was a lot of time. And the back end of this uh, platform was very simple. It was based on, um, on a Google Sheet that would collect, that would gather all the posts collected through uh, Facebook and Instagram using a robot called Zapier that helped me to scrap this data. Basically, there was a call for participation. We would do this um, web scrapping. The, web, the content scrap would go on this back end. And from this back end, I would be the one doing the curation and running the publication script to send finally the approved posts online. And my sources were looking like this uh, table now. So every new post would be a new raw in my um, Google Sheet and have added to it some metadata. And also I later on could add my own annotations on these sources. So now I would like to talk to you on what I called the kitchen, the historian's kitchen. That was a bit of a, a metaphor that I got inspired by Michael Frisch in, in his way of understanding public history. Like public history is a, is, a, is a space for experimentation on interaction, on building new things. And perhaps in a house, the kitchen is this place where we try new recipes and we try to improvise when necessary. <clears throat> and the kitchen was a very happy metaphor also because uh, sometimes we do keep cooking together. Sometimes we have different ex um, ingredients and we have to improvise. And in my case, since the, the memory harvest from memo record was, uh, how can I say, this was maybe one of my first realizations of failure. And I think this is really important to talk about failure when we talk about digital projects. And the failure of memo record was after this whole roadmap I showed you, um, the collection was really small and you can see the numbers on the screen. So this was really, really felt like the time investment to get this number of responses was really, really not balanced. And even though I decided to take a look at it qualitatively and try to cook these memories, try to do something with what was harvested. And for this, <coughs> sorry, for this I engaged with some concept, uh, working concepts that were how I equipped my kitchen 
So concepts like the mediated memories by Joseph Van Dyck and technology of memories by House and Churchill was really important. So these concepts at least help me to deal with how memories appear and are socialized, what are the practices around these memories when they are born digital or they are digitized. So this was really important. And a further step that was really new to me and unexpected was the digital ethnography as a must or as yes, a really necessary step to be added. As a historian, we know we want to have our sources, but we, you saw, just saw in my table that um, my sources were just raw with data and set it on it. And another limitation of this um, collection was that technically, because I depend on third parties like Facebook and Instagram, I could not scratch the whole content. Maybe in the past three or four years I could, but since uh, 2008, there was a scandal in Facebook and 2019, and there was a scandal on Facebook and they changed their policy. And I, it was no longer possible to scrap the data from comment section. And the comment section became to me, uh, perhaps one of the most interesting parts of this exercise of crowdsourcing. Although I was not targeting comments when I first built the platform, I was believing that the most important part of everything would be the posts with their photos, with the text or videos, songs, whatever, because there was this possibility of multimedia. But I was not taking into account how I would deal with the interaction and the conversation happening on this, and on, on the timeline of this post. So for them, it was necessary to add digital ethnography because I was not able to download this post to script this data, it would not be fair and ethical to just work with screenshots of these posts. First, it was not technically possible. It would be possible if I have very few collaborations like I did, but at the same time, if you take a screenshot of something that is so dynamic, your screenshot is just gonna be a snapshot and not take care of the evolving nature of this conversation but also the participants involved in the conversation of the posts, they were not allowing me to save their data. So the participants who mainly share their posts with the hashtag memo record, they did agree on sharing their content, but their friends, their followers, they were not uh, aware and perhaps not uh, willing to share with me. That's why I came up with this uh, participants observation on uh, online platforms. So in the menu of this kitchen, I had this transnational perspective because I ended up collecting memories, not only from Portuguese and Italians like I wanted, but I opened up the crowdsourcing for all nationalities. And uh, we had the Italians who were believed and had this myth around them to be the most well integrated uh, community in Luxembourg and the Portuguese who arrived later in Luxembourg and that believed in the 70s that Luxembourg would be the new El Dorado and that would save them from the conditions in Portugal that was really, really difficult during under the regime of Salazar. <laughs> and the mise en place to say what I would work with, the post annotations, the ethnography notes, and the, my annotations on the sensitivity, on the sentimental analysis of each post, because I took care of analyzing of also the multimedia content and the text that followed and the coding of these uh, posts. As every participant had different languages, I decided to code the whole um, collection in English to be able to work with a unique language throughout the corpus and which were the directions, the ways to do, <laughs> to cook this, uh, this memory. So uh, I used what we historians normally do when we also do with uh, analog sources, cross-referencing -reference sources, but in this case, cross-referencing posters and taking into account the metadata of these posts. So this was one exercise towards digital uh, source criticism. 
also take into account, for instance, that when we do digital source criticism, and this is also discussed by Andrea's speakers, you will see later on the references, you can get this paper, it's in German actually. And we need also an interface criticism, we need algorithm criticism. So the digital uh, exit, the analyze, the exercise to analyze this digital uh, board material requires also to analyze the whole environment and how it works. And for social media algorithms was also really important to be taken into account. And finally, comparing these posts with the oral history material I collect throughout this community sensitization phase. Basically, to give you an, a taste, because I want to later on uh, switch to discuss the hermeneutics of Prax, but to give you a taste of uh, the findings, when we look at the cloud for the social media posts, we see a sensible difference between uh, the oral history interviews coding. The oral history interviews coding highlights the, in an important way, the weight of the work of the word work. And of course, for migrants in Luxembourg uh, that went to Luxembourg, Italians that went to Luxembourg uh, at first, the first generations and first waves were to work in the mines in Luxembourg. And the recent migrants that came even after 2008, after the crisis in Europe, that went to Luxembourg or to work in the European institutions, they all had work as one reference to their move to Luxembourg. But when we look at the memories shared online on social media, work would appear, but not as uh, prominent. And I realized that perhaps <clears throat> the way we expect the total history works that allows people to tell in a long interview, we, it allows people to really do the storytelling of one's life, perhaps editing this one life, it's a sort of performance as well. Uh, this is an interesting content and historians have been de debating about how we interpret oral history for long. But social media showed to me uh, and left me this impression that we have more spontaneity and more freedom perhaps, and maybe colloquiality on the social media environment than on the oral history interviews. And perhaps for more prompty reactions, uh, social media showed me that it's possible to reach other contents that in an oral history interview, it was not. Maybe when you have an oral history project that you meet people for many, many, many times, different appointments and you get ice break, you really get to other topics like that. But when you at first contact people, you get more, the impression that the participants are stiff in front of the camera. Again, the technology of memory, the camera, the recording put, puts a weight in the settings of the interview. But on the social media, it was, uh, let's say, an easier participation. Although some people interacted to me a lot on the private uh, channels on social media. And this was another um, obser observation that I wanted to do. Because on social media, due to this colloquiality, I became a sort of the gatekeeper of my own project. People would contact me and I would become known uh, of them. And people would share their stories with me on the messenger, on the messenger, for instance. And a problematic of this was likewise when we have oral history and we turn off the recording device, people tell a lot of interesting stories. <laughs> And when we go to the recording session, the retelling is not the same. And many people would say they would share something later on publicly, and they never did. So <clears throat> this, to give you a bit of the, the results of the project and the analysis uh, I further wrote in the thesis, um, I could conclude that actually there was a lot of discrimination stories there was a lot of uh, pressures in society, perhaps integration, but not uh, an incorporation of the migrants. A lot of this, especially between Italians and Portuguese, uh, there was stories of different weight and integration in the work market in Luxembourg. So this is a further reading 
that I invite you to read on the thesis, but now I would like to uh, talk about the final um, analysis of my work on this kitchen. And um, perhaps highlighting the difficult of dealing with this born material that was so, so difficult to grasp the broader context and do an in-depth analysis, which I believe is one of the biggest uh, limitation of working with digital born material in projects like that with crowdsourcing as a main thing. For example, now we are seeing a lot of Corona archives and that do collections that are similar to mine and they perhaps will also face a similar condition. But with the difference that while Memo Record was a small collection, with Corona Archive, because it's a pandemic, it's worldwide, we have a big scale and perhaps using all the methods to analyze can give new answers. But the scale for Memo Record was also important to be considered because although small, the collection was really diverse. And this multivocality in the collection brought a problem about how to build the narrative, the historical narrative how to build this intrigue that uh, Paul Hiker used to say is necessary for historians to come from the general to a more homogene narrative with a linear narrative, how to build this intrigue with the different subjects having so, uh, such a diverse experience. This was another, another difficulty. And for filling the gaps where I could not reach further with the posts, I needed to resort on, for me, this was very particular, very personal. For me, the solution was to, to go towards the conjectural paradigm of Ginsburg and try to navigate this database histories using other sources, other autobiographies that I found of migrants in Portuguese, other secondary sources, uh, reports, demographic data, and so on. So, I brought a few points of reflection that will bring us in the direction of what I called uh, hermeneutics of practice. So this hermeneutics of practice is stands between this practice and theory. And now I would like to talk what this experience uh, uh, told me about, taught me about the digital public history uh, interface. First of all, it allowed a great uh, exercise of shared authority, both building the platform and having feedbacks and also interacting with people online. Finally, it was also really interesting this participatory design as a way to empower participants in a qualitative way to shape the concept of the project and not only participate by giving something and or transcribing something or just having one quantitative input. The hands-on um, phase, so to say, was uh, a bit more interesting to think about digital history and perhaps more interesting to you, to this audience today. Because there was a lot of thinking, there was a space, there was an environment, attitude the age, especially because I could collaborate with people. There was this environment to try what it means to do digital history in the training zone of digital history, like Max Kemen used to um, just wrote his thesis about this trading zone. So the work with computer experts was something to learn from a lot, learning a new language, learning how to communicate with them and learning to work in their pace too, in the minded time. And Gavin Zasma um, was used to say that uh, we are working towards a new hybridity and this hybridity he says that it's about combining the old methods with the new methods, which I fully agree. And as you, you saw, it was what I tried to do. Instead of all the new methods, we, we have only positive sides of the new methods and forget about the old stuff. No, it's about combining the, the both skills, the skills that we have, or like Andreas Fikas once wrote about a digital history, history or a digital historicism. So is it possible to combine um, the historicism with this digital method? So this is the one hybridity I want to highlight, but another aspect of this hybridity is the possibility to work with boundary objects that are hybrid per se. 
that work uh, and belong to zones of design, of communication, of computational development, of uh, library and archive of uh, information, science information in a broad sense, so to say. And this was <coughs> uh, what memo record became, a boundary object to me, to allow me to reflect on these uh, possibilities of hybridity and trading zone. But also this digital component brought a lot of interferences. So the disturbances, I call them later on, uh, furthering my work as interferences that can force us to have detours in our work. So at first, I believe this is a project that was very surpassed by uh, error prone process. So when trying to build in the platform, I have a lot of problems on running the script and finding the right, the right way to do. For instance, ethically, it was not possible to respect the GDPR in, in Europe. It was not possible to upload the content from Facebook and Instagram. So basically Memo Record has iframes to the original sources. And this was a bit of, uh, in the beginning, we didn't know how to do. And the, the consequence of it is that we have a lot of different timings in the research. That is not perhaps the same timing as a traditional research with a traditional funding scheme. And this might be really deeply considered for digital public history projects that are done in academia. And for the point that I was talking to Melanie <laughs> in, the, in the wonder, uh, in the meet and greet area, that it's the project and sustainability. My project uh, is now up to date, but in the next two, three years, it's gonna be out of date and I'm gonna need to update the iframes and whether, what is gonna happen if Facebook changes something and the iframes are broken. So I don't have uh, the power to run an update every year alone if I don't have funding for it, for instance. So this is something that we need to consider. Oops. And on the hermeneutics of practice uh, end, I believe that everything I've been saying to you so far it's about hermeneutics of practice. I have been describing to you what was like to develop this digital public history project. So this documenting of uh, the process or what I call this reflexive turn uh, is about making, implicit, making the implicit aspects of a project explicit. And why this is so important in digital, uh, digital scholarship to, to use a broader term. This is important if we want digital work to be acknowledged, to be respected, to be commonly shared within a wider uh, discipline, or if we want, as the, the Hoy Rosen's Y Center discussed a few years ago in a white paper, if we want that the arguments done with digital history reach a wider historiographical conversation. We need to make what we do fully transparent, fully visit, visible, so adopt a radical openness to make it able to be criticized, to make it able to be interpreted by people who are maybe not familiarized with the digital components, and also to those who are familiarized to be able to have a critical stand that really refers to the whole methods and not only to the outputs. So, Perhaps um, this hermeneutics of practice is about identif ident identifying these digital interferences and discussing them between this practice and theory theoretical frame. But I also ask myself uh, in a dialogue with uh, Ian Hacken, who is a philosopher of science that once created a project of styles referring <coughs> Also in dialogue with the another historians uh, with Alistair Crombie, describing how a new style of reasoning emerge. And a real style, a new style of reasoning to hacking can emerge when some new types of entities emerge. So to say objects of research, forms of evidence, sentences, so to say new ways of uh, saying something is true or false, and 
laws or modalities. Of course, for historians, we don't relate really closely to laws, but we can understand perhaps these sentences as, for, for example, digital source criticism being a new sentence to our discipline, being a new way to determine something is false or true. And digital born material being a new sort of evidence. So these are all objects for digital history. And I asked myself whether this could lead us to establish this style of reasoning and sharing this wider in the discipline. And my, my conversation actually relates to something that predates the digital debate, but it's the work of Michel de Certeau when he says uh, that all historiographical discourses are preceded and enabled fabricated from a specific social place. So going already to my conclusion notes, I want to discuss with you, <coughs> finally, that what I did was only possible because I was at C2DH, because the context of my research allowed me to reach this stage and to make these reflections. So once uh, Andreas Fickers wrote a response to Rens Bod, about digital humanities in, in, a, in a review, in a journal. And he was discussing how data, Rens Bod was saying how the data was king for digital humanities. And Andreas Fickers replied saying that if data is king, context is crown for the analysis, for the digital source criticism. But I would like to bring this context a bit further to think about the environment and the research conditions we are living in. So, in my thesis, it's very experimental. I don't know if I will bring this in metaphors further, but I reflect about the cross, crossroads of digital history as a sort of intersection, uh, a crucial context to develop this sort of project. And I highlight the importance of openness, collaboration, infrastructuring, training and evaluation. Training and evaluation may be the last uh, and the least developed at C2DH at the moment, but infrastructuring was something that was there when I started developing memo record. So we have a research access for digital research infrastructure that was what perhaps allowed me to go at this point. But thinking about public history and the intersection between digital and public history, I propose also that we consider a roundabout for digital public history. And this roundabout, as in the traffic, is something that allows people to meet, allows people to move, and to keep going without stopping too much. Of course, roundabouts are annoying in the traffic, but I like the, the metaphor to think that different countries, different cities, different situations may have uh, different flavors of roundabouts, and everybody can build its own. And uh, for a roundabout to be different than a crossroads of digital history, I believe that we need to add shared authority and participatory design as principles. Of course, I won't develop it here now because my time is almost over, but I will leave you the invitation to share with me your thoughts about it. And in this conclusion, so to say, uh, it's an open conclusion, it's not really a big conclusion, uh, but an uh, open conclusion for this talk is to tell you that the work was about a process that was described, was about an analysis that was annotated and that was shared in the thesis, and the outputs that were the digital memory platform memo record, also the GitHub repository for memo record, and the Manifold uh, publication, Manifold Scholarship is a platform developed by University Press of Minnesota that allows uh, long breadth publications on digital platform with addition to further resources, inline multimedia contents, and all sort of um, digital aids. So these um, were the main outputs, but the final note is that it was not 360 experiment. I got this criticism from Serge Noiret, and I fully agree with him that my experiment was 360, 359. And the one degree that is missing is really about the sustainability of the project and how can we 
reuse, use and reuse and guarantee its life in the future. So the limitations of this uh, research was, for instance, um, about the fact that I could do some qualitative involvement with the community, but I could not reuse the project with the community, which would be very sustainable, believing that it's already funded and it's there. I could do something with the community, for instance, an extreme citizen science project. It could be interesting to draw further conclusions, perhaps inviting this community to evaluate these co-created mediated memories. And finally, it would be really useful to reflect more on the ethical pivots of the project, on the real life, long life, the sustainability, the technical sustainability of the platform. So these are things that I need to consider in the future. Now I leave you with this link that I can copy and paste in the chat later on, where I have the work cited reference. And I thank you very much for your attention, for following me, and I look forward for your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>